Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Parrish. I'm head of chemistry simulations at QC Ware Court in Palo Alto. And it's my pleasure to share with you today some of the details of the very fruitful collaboration that we've had over the last year and a half with Covestro, uh, located in Cologne, Germany. And my uh, counterpart on the German side is Christian Gogolin, who's an expert at quantum computing, uh, who works in the digital R&D group at Covestro. Our first question today is, why is it even interesting to be considering quantum computing for materials design applications? And as one of many possible answers for that, I will just share with you Covestro's interest in it. Covestro is a, a leading producer of both innovative new polymers as well as raw materials that go into polymer synthesis in a wide variety of applications areas uh, in, in domain chemistry uh, and things of that nature. Covestro has a very strong uh, simulations uh, pipeline that feeds into the design of new materials and, and new ingredients uh, and new chemistries. And uh, in particular in the digital R&D group uh, at Covestro, they look at everything that ranges from modeling molecules one atom or even one electron at a time, all the way up to methods that can uh, study systems on the order of one millimeter to one meter in size continuum methods. And all of these uh, simulation methods uh, funneling into eventual input into what the next generation of polymeric materials are going to be. And they see a real uh, opportunity for near-term advantage on very near-term quantum computers uh, in the area of quantum methods for the, the modeling of molecules and materials at the very smallest scales, one electron or, or one, one atom at a time uh, in these things, uh, for several reasons. One of the reasons is that the existing classical methods, as you'll see, that try to solve these equations struggle a lot in many cases, either providing inaccurate results or results that take too long to run on classical computers. And the other is that the architecture of quantum computers seems to lend itself very well to the natural solution of these problems. And so uh, we've been having this, this collaboration over the last 18 months to try to lower the barriers uh, to actually achieving some quantum advantage with that goal. And uh, I'll share you, with you a couple of vignettes of the things that we've been doing within that space. At this point, it's probably relevant to discuss uh, how do we even begin to use quantum computing within materials design? And to do this, I'll go over a little bit about what the applications problem of uh, solving the electronic Schrodinger equation is, as well as how we currently tackle that on, on you know, the current quantum algorithms before we get into the new stuff. So I love this problem, uh, quantum chemistry, uh, because it takes four lines to write it down and then it takes the rest of your natural life to solve it. Uh, it. It's very simple. What we're trying to do is to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation to model how the electrons of a molecule bind to that molecule. And if we could solve that equation, we, we could tell anything we would want to know, any property you would want to know about that molecule. Is it a good drug? Is it a good solar cell? Is it a good material? All these would fall out of the end of that solution. And conceptually, what we have is we are given the Hamiltonian matrix, which is this big table of numbers I've schematically represented right here in, in this table. And it's very easy to conceptually see what goes into it. It's a polynomial amount of information about the interactions between the electrons that goes into it. Um, but then it's a, an enormous matrix. It, it scales exponentially in the row and the column dimension with the number of electrons or atoms that there are in the system. And our job is to take this uh, matrix and to partially diagonalize it to find the ground state energy, maybe a few excited states, and maybe some other properties of the, the molecule that we're looking at. So conceptually very straightforward what we have to do. It's just a big matrix diagonalization problem, but very, very difficult to actually do this in practice because of the exponential size. You run out of RAM and you run out of compute hardware uh, floating point performance uh, very quickly trying to solve this uh, with brute force. Now they knew this 70 years ago and they didn't just give up at that point. There have been 70 plus years of really excellent classical approximate methods that, that, that approximate the solution of this equation in one way or another. Things like the very famous density functional theory approximation, which is widely used in, in materials design. The issue you find there is that, especially for the most critical applications in things like drug design, uh, solar cell design, materials design, uh, the existing approximations like density functional theory are either too expensive to solve for the size of the system you want, or they are inaccurate for the property that you want to model. And so you're confronted with this intractable trade-off between the computational effort required on the classical side and the accuracy you need to be able to do materials design uh, on, on the application side. This is where, this goes back to the very earliest ideas for using quantum computing in, in any sort of application is you can use it to represent other physical systems that are difficult to model classically. 
Uh, what it comes down to, we're trying to represent the wave function of the electrons of a big molecular system like this. And the complexity arises on the classical side because this is a quantum object. And if you look at a quantum computer, uh, qubit architecture, for instance, it's essentially a quantum wave function of a different type of particle, not electrons like we have in the, uh, the top example, but in this case, qubits like we have on the bottom here. And the idea is maybe we could build a mapping between the two of these and essentially build a doppelganger in the quantum computer of the electronic wave function of the molecule out here. And if we could do that, we could essentially read off all the properties that we care about uh, regarding this molecule at the back end. You know, what color is it? Uh, how does it absorb light from the sun? How do we manufacture it? Those kinds of things, uh, they all correspond to observable properties we could, we could read off here. Now, I do wanna point you to one very particular part of this uh, example. The, the algorithm we use in the sort of modern era of quantum computing for this is called the Variational Quantum Eigensolver, which has a very nice and rich history dating back to 2014. Uh, the key is when we're trying to build this wave function of the electronic system in the quantum computer, we apply a series of gate elements called an entangler circuit to actually construct that wave function. And the design of that entangler circuit is something of an art. And it's very important that we find really good recipes for it that actually respect the right symmetries of the electronic system we're going for. And that's one of the major results I want to share with you uh, today in, in just a few minutes here. So very simple what we conceptually need to do. Why is it difficult at the moment? Uh, I would say it's because we need a lot more practice with it. If, if the machine came along tomorrow with 100 to 200 you know, medium quality qubits in it, I don't think we're quite ready to use that machine to actually provide advantage for the, this uh, paradigm. And the reason is we're currently doing things that are on very small systems with a, a few atoms uh, in them. Uh, our circuits that we use for those entanglers that I just mentioned are very deep. Uh, most designs for them right now. And they may or may not respect the right symmetries of uh, the system. And so we need lots of gates to be able to do chemistry on, on uh, uh, a near-term quantum computer at the moment. And then the very last part is really we need to do a lot more work in the post-processing side. I think a lot of the algorithms these days are very good at telling you what the ground state energy, this, this very first block here in the, the upper left of this matrix is, but they're not so good at telling you things you wanna know from an industrial design uh, standpoint, which is a, a little bit further down that pipeline uh, of extracting higher order observables from the, the quantum solution. We'll get into both of those topics in a few minutes here. All right, so our, our first advance I wanna tell you about, uh, we just posted this to the archive last night and uh, the link will be for that in, in just a few minutes. The question here is about the design of a good VQE entangler circuit for the modeling of those electrons in molecules. So there's an old result, which is actually one of the most powerful parts of, of quantum computing, which is how you do this when you don't have any constraints in your system. So let's say I have six qubits given here by the, the, uh, the quantum circuit diagram here it has six wires in it. And I wanna perform sort of an arbitrary, very powerful rotation, which is called an SU uh, gate, special unitary gate on those six qubits. Well, six qubits, you've never seen probably a circuit that has a six qubit gate in it because they make gates usually with one or two qubits in them. So how do, how do we actually build a, a, a six qubit operator uh, out of you know, simpler elements? Well, there's this beautiful result that is sort of ancient history now in, in quantum computing, which is that you can build what we call a fabric, uh, a set of, in this case, two qubit gates that connect you know, two nearest neighbor uh, qubits here, and they alternate left nearest neighbor and right nearest neighbor uh, connections and when you build up this fabric of these uh, smaller gates, they actually build together and at first approximate, and then eventually at sufficient depth universally cover any operator that you would want over here in this special unitary group with a very simple recipe for how you actually build the individual gates in terms of things you would be able to code in Qiskit or, or Circ or something like that. This is a very, very powerful result. Do note though that it is doing an arbitrary rotation in unconstrained qubits, uh, that is distinguishable particle two level systems there that, that we have to do. We want to try to do the same thing for electrons to build an entangler circuit for, for the, this paradigm that would be possibly much shorter than anything we've seen so far and much simpler as far as the connectivity required. But the problem is there's a huge gotcha and that is that qubits are not electrons. They are, they are not the same thing. Basically, when we made this mapping here, uh, this, this, uh, the devil is in the details of this double arrow here about how we map the electrons onto the qubits. And in particular, the electrons that we're trying to model, if you represent them in qubits, the resulting operations are gonna to have to have very high and very specific constraints on, on which rotations you do for reasons that we'll see with a particular example right here. So first, let's talk about the most efficient mapping that, or the most common mapping that everybody uses in the field. It's called the Jordan-Wigner mapping. It's very simple. We have these, these concepts called orbitals. Uh, these are basically just shapes that we place around the molecule. 
and they can either have an electron in them or not. And that's really all you need to know about orbitals is that's how we construct the solution to the Schrodinger equation is build a set of orbitals and then put the electrons into different combinations uh, of those orbitals. When we map this to your qubits, what we do very simply in the jordan wigner mapping is we say qubit A represents for orbital A whether there is an electron there or not. If it's in the zero state, there is no electron there. And if it's in the one state, there is an electron there. And then the same thing for uh, B and so forth. And so what you see is if you examine now the, the Hilbert space of the qubits, the set of all configurations you have, it's very simple what's going on here. This zero, zero, for instance, just represents that we have neither an electron in A nor an electron in B, a zero electron state that, that we have, which is perfectly reasonable. Uh, the next two, there is in this one, an orbital in B, but not in A, and then vice versa. And then the last one, there are two electrons in the system, uh, one in, in each of these orbitals here. And you're starting to see the, uh, the root of the difficulty here which is that the entanglers we had on the previous slide for generic qubits, they do not actually respect the groupings that I've outlined here. What this means is they will actually, if you put them into your circuit, they will take you from a state that has a given definite number of electrons and they will mix it all over the place with contaminated states that have many different numbers of electrons in them. And this is actually a precondition of the Schrodinger equation is you, you are instructed to solve for the, the answer of the Schrodinger equation within a, a, a state that has a given definite number of electrons in it. Uh, for instance, if you have a water molecule, that is always gonna have 10 electrons in it and you must solve within that subspace uh, and respect that symmetry. Uh, I've just sketched this here. In, in real life, it's a little bit more difficult even. There are three symmetries you have to solve. The number of, number of alpha or spin up electrons, the number of spin down or beta electrons. And then there's also this thing called the total spin uh, quantum number, which is a very nasty operator. And all three of those, you have to respect the fact that when you're inside one of those symmetry groups, you cannot leave it with your rotation that you do on, on the Hilbert space. And so confronted with this, there have been oh, almost a decade now of really good entangler circuits designed by many different people uh, that you can read, for instance, in our archive paper, our, our overview of that literature there. And the, the commonality here is that they attempt to approach things that exactly or partially satisfy these symmetry constraints, but at the cost that up to this point, they really have not managed to obtain something that looks anything like a gate fabric like we saw on the previous slide. And our result is to try to have our cake and eat it too, to get something that looks like a gate fabric, but that also exactly respects these very critical symmetry requirements that you've got to have the right number of electrons in your system when you, you, you're studying materials. And we managed to do this, we think. Uh, the paper on the archive shows the recipe for this. It is a fabric that looks like this. So instead of being two qubit uh, uh, gate elements that we had on the previous uh, slide uh, for our arbitrary rotations, they have to be necessarily four qubit uh, gate elements that have a, a decomposition you'll see in a few minutes here. Um, and then they alternate so that they talk to, uh, each qubit talks to a few nearest neighbors to the left and the right of it. But other than that, they're just, you can imagine it as a fabric that has a slightly wider weave to it than, than the, the one you saw previously. Um, and then it has to have a very particular definition of what the gate elements in, inside that fabric are. In fact, each one of them has a, a two-part composition to it. Uh, the pi is something else that we use to accelerate the convergence of the parameters in the fabric there. Uh, and, and what these two gate elements do actually is fairly simply understood in, in, in terms of a picture that we find from classical electronic structure theory. The first one continuously changes the definition of one orbital into the other in a very smooth way. And that's called an orbital rotation, a very, very common concept from classical electronic structure theory. And the other looks and asks, do I have two electrons in uh, an alpha and a beta in the, in the the lower orbital and none in the upper orbital. And if so, I'll exchange them with the upper orbital or and vice versa. And that's called a diagonal pair exchange gate. And so it turns out when you, when you build a fabric with these two gate elements in it, it exactly respects all the quantum number symmetries that we require, as well as providing what seems to be very good expressiveness. And of course is in the form of a, a gate fabric that, that we have here. So uh, we're pretty excited about the uh, new initial numerical results are showing that uh, when you get to a certain depth, which is usually very large for a large number of qubits, you get this very sudden decrease in the error from uh, whatever it was to essentially as far as you can push it on the simulators. This is the onset of universality. This means that this, this gate actually covers all the rotations that we're looking for. More practically though, is at the left end of this curve, even with very few layers, we're able to get below the so-called chemical accuracy of one kcal per mole in absolute energies. The story is actually a little bit more complicated than that as far as what you really want, but it's a sufficiently good metric that, that uh, you know, even by a very small depth in the Hilbert space, we're able to get uh, uh, good properties out of the system uh, because of that. 
It shows really nice behavior as far as things like properties that are not the energy, for instance, the structure of the electronic wave function, even at very core steps, uh, very closely resembles the exact configuration interaction uh, wave function. And it has one more property that is if you initialize the parameters in those uh, gate fabrics sufficiently well, uh, it seems to have less trouble with what are called barren plateaus, these regions where you are not converged when you're optimizing your parameters, but you don't have any good search directions to go in and the optimizer really struggles. We seem to be ameliorating that to some degree with the circuits that we've uh, constructed with the right initialization uh, strategies. And that may prove to be very valuable when we go to actually deploy this you know, in real hardware instead of the simulators that we're, we're currently using. So we are just very excited about this result. And it's, it's, it's of course, one small movement uh, in a larger field of, of really good work by many authors that you can read in the back part of our paper that have really pushed the state of the art in entangler circuits over the last few years from where it would have been unthinkable to do fermionic or electronic VQE on a near-term quantum computer to now where I think it's actually could be routinely tractable within the next you know, couple of years here. The last thing I wanna do with just a couple of minutes here is to discuss another angle, which is after you've reduced the circuit depth and the constraints on the topology of the circuit sufficiently, what do you do with that result? Because right now we've just gotten the, the energy out of the system. So, so how do you do design of materials with that? Well, you need other properties that come out of the end of the quantum circuit from that. One of those properties is called the nuclear gradient. So the idea here is if I have a molecule like still bean, what I've just done was actually give you a single point on the potential energy landscape here, where the, the X and X1 and X2 and other coordinates are the positions of all of the nuclei of, of this uh, system. And so when you're doing chemical reactions or you're trying to make a material go from one endpoint to another, what you're really doing is flying around on this very high dimensional hyperspace. And a critical quantity we use in classical electronic structure theory to do this, it's called the gradient. It's just the uh, derivative of the energy with respect to the uh, motions of the nuclei. And it represents the force that is pushing the electron or the nuclei around in this chemical landscape and causing it to transform, say, from uh, one stable isomer, which is a place where the gradient advantages, to another. Those are the reactants and products in your, your system, as well as can help you do things like find reaction paths, uh, which will tell you things like how long is the reaction going to take uh, to have to go to take place, or what can I do to catalyze the reaction and things of that nature. This gradient is a very critical uh, part uh, of this assay that you do once you've done the electronic structure computation. Um, it looks like you need to redo the calculation essentially for every nuclear coordinate, which is a very onerous requirement. Um, but we've worked out, we've taken techniques from classical electronic structure theory and with Covestro managed to uh, move them into the, the quantum computing domain and are able to get the gradient now analytically for essentially the same cost as it would, would co cost to do the underlying VQE energy optimization, which is really, uh, I think, quite a neat thing and will be a very uh, powerful pragmatic tool as we go to start applying this on hardware. And so uh, that, the paper for that will be coming out fairly soon in the archive and, and we'll see uh, what all the details are in that. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and thank my colleagues, Christian, and our other authors, Gianluca and David, for their efforts on this uh, really neat paper I think that we just put on the archive the other day. And if you have any comments or questions you'd like to follow up on, you're certainly welcome to write either Christian Gogolin or myself uh, to, to follow up with that at a later time. Thank you, Rob. That was uh, that was fantastic. We've actually had uh, Christian on the, uh, on the chat uh, answering questions uh, as they come in. Uh, so that was uh, that was very kind of him to to, to log in there. Um, we really appreciate your time and uh, some fantastic work we're doing. You're doing there, and we look forward to seeing uh, updates uh, in the next uh, twelve months of further progress that you make. Excellent. It's it's a great collaboration, and it's really neat because Covestro has really a really good view on what they want to do with this, what you would use to immediately impact the materials design pipeline. And it's a long road between there and the quantum circuits that we're playing with, but we have to put together a solution that goes the whole distance for that. And that's really what's so exciting about this collaboration. So, yeah. Absolutely. We, we look forward to more good things coming down the pipe. Thank you very much, Rob, and uh, good evening, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Good talking with you.